Good morning. I've tangled my mask up in this thing here. That'll be all right for a minute. Uh, so thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you. It is, and I mean this, it's, a, it's not just a privilege, but a blessing to come to God's place and be with you this morning. And this morning I'll talk to you about the woman at the well. And our church is to be like that. I was just saying earlier on to someone that our churches should be a place like Jacob's Well where you come and meet God and you can find peace and you can find a Savior who will not condemn you, but he'll love you. And so you're here today, you're loved and know you're loved. And, you're, and I pray that you do, you do feel the presence, you do know the presence of God and you leave here today more enriched in your relationship with God and that he really truly does speak into your heart this morning. So I have, oh, just so you, some of you may not know who I am, you think, who's this, who's this stranger? Some of you do know, but my name's Paddy, and I'm from Oma. I'm a lay reader in St. Columbus Church in Oma, and when I'm not doing this, I'm firefighting, because that's what I do the rest of the time. And then sometimes when my wife gets me to do a few things, I go and do those too. <laughs> but uh, I am truly blessed in the things I get to do and to serve God. And a few notices for you this morning. Uh, emergency cover up until Wednesday of this week will be John Woods. And then the choir practice is on Wednesday the 24th at 8.30. The Dyson Synod is on Wednesday 25th November at 7, and that's via Zoom. And the Holy Communion service will be next Sunday the 20th at 11 a.m. And Advent, which is beginning next Sunday, Sunday the 20th, will be an Advent carol service. Uh, at 7.30. Yeah, I see it on the screen anyway. And the food bank, if you have anything for the food bank, please drop it in and we'll make sure it gets to Anna Skillen. So let us worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Lord, direct our way, our thoughts. Help us to pray and to lift our hearts to worship you in spirit, in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Spirit of God fills the whole world. Let us worship by singing, O God, you search me.
Let us pray and confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us of all that is past and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the colic for the Sunday before Advent, Eternal Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord and King. Keep the church in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace, and, and bring the whole created order to worship at his feet, who, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The reading, is, the reading is from John, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a sign in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of the ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him what he, what he would have given you, given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than the father of Jacob, who gave us the, the well and drank from it himself? as he also did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never, never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of well-being up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't go thirsty and to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go back, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is, is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worship on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for our salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper, worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit, in the truth. They, for they are the kind of worshippers worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, Christ, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. 
Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want? Or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. And let us sing together as the deer pants for the water. Father God, I humbly come before you to, to speak your word. I'm not worthy, but Lord, you have chosen me to do this. Lord, I pray that I will be honorable to you, that I will listen to what you're telling me to tell your people, that I will be led by the Spirit, and that same Spirit, Lord, will flow through this church, and I'll break down the barriers in our hearts and minds that would stop us from believing and trusting in you this morning and hearing this word, and, we, and living it out. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, last Sunday, Andrew had asked me a while back about doing this Sunday, but last Sunday he, he just asked me, would you have a reading for this Sunday? And also to remind me that this is an all-age service, which I can see it is all-age, because I didn't know what that actually was. And, but he said, I would appreciate, we would appreciate if you'd done an all-age talk. Well, one problem, I didn't have a reading, and the other problem was, 
Watson all age talk. I mean, surely we do that all the time. So I wasn't quite sure, and I actually looked up and seen what Hannah done with her team, and I thought, well, I can't do that. But so I thought, well, I'll get a reading. So I panicked. I sort of thought, right? I sort of thought, what can do? It? No reading came to mind. I thought, what would be an all age Bible reading? But I realised they all are. So what won't be? You know, what specifically? So well, when you're stuck, you Google everything, don't you? Nowadays, you want the answer. You know, you Google it, and uh, so. But Google didn't have the answer because they asked, you know, reckon some good all-age talks, and nothing was made any sense. So then I did what I should have done in the first place, and that was I prayed. So it was funny. We always go to prayer last when we should have go to prayer the first. And when I was so I prayed, and shortly after I was listening to some music and uh, some worship music, and I heard this song which I'm familiar with by a guy called Zach Williams. He's a big boy with a big beard, and he. I used to be a rock star and all the rest, but he's a worship leader, he's a Christian, and he sings this song, and it was, Fear is a Liar, Fear is a Liar, and straight away, and when I listened to the lyrics, I got it. The lyric, these are some of the lyrics. When he, being fear, told you you weren't good enough, when he, being fear, told you you weren't worthy, you weren't loved, you weren't beautiful, that even grace couldn't change you, fear, he is a liar, and straight away, it came to me, the woman at the well. I knew that was the reading, that was the woman at the well. Because she was a woman, when we hear about her, was considered not good enough, not loved, not worthy, not beautiful, that grace couldn't change, the fear. She lived in fear. She lived in fear. And I wonder, can, at this all-age service, no matter what age, can you relate to living in fear? And you'll hear the fear I talk about when we go through it. This fear, when we come into church this morning and we all say, how are you getting on? Oh, I'm doing great. Well, the, Christ, the Christ, next question should be, are you really? Do you mean you come into church and you have not a care in the world? You've never had a care in the world. You've never had a fear. I think we're all bluffers. Because what we see is this. God sees in here and he sees what really is going on. And the thing with fear, I've realized, it doesn't discriminate. Young people struggle with fear. People like myself, who I think they call them now elderly, I suppose. We're elderly. I've got fears. We have fears in our, all our lives, and we have suffered it. And it's not a fear of being afraid of the dark, or afraid of some scary movie, or maybe our finances are not going so well, or maybe education. You know, you're, we're, we keep telling people, oh, you need A stars, and then they get a C. They have that fear of getting a C, so they can't function, so they don't think they're good enough. And that's all, that's just, that's just part of life, because sometimes you end up being where you're meant to be. I end up with two GCSEs, and they have a really good job in a fire service. It's just you don't need it because there's greater things within you, so you shouldn't have this fear. But this fear he's talking about this morning is condemnation. Condemnation is caused by lies, lies that you tell yourself and other people tell you. In this Bible reading, we see three kinds of people with, to do with this fear. There's the person who suffers this fear, who lives in fear. And then two, there's the people who cause this people to have this fear because of what they say about them, the people who gossip and who make judgments without having all the knowledge. And then there's the people who tell people the truth so they know the truth, so they can live a life without the fear, without the fear of condemnation, because they know about Jesus, who is the one who releases you from that fear. So when I was reading... I love this reading, John, anyway. I'm so glad it came up because every time I read it, I read something different and something else jumps out at me that I've never seen before. And one of the things that jumped out at me was verse 4. It says, Now Jesus had, had to go to Samaria. Now, this is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world, had to go to Samaria. He didn't have to do anything, but he obviously did because it says in the Bible, because every word's true, he says he had to go to Samaria. See, the thing is, Samaria is not a place Jews would go to. For centuries, over 700 years, there was religious and there was, pre there was racial prejudice between them. And then Jews did not associate with Samaritans, and Samaritans knew that. So it wasn't, they would actually go the long way around than go through Samaria. But here Jesus chose to go here. He chose to go where the Jews don't go, which tells you he, he knew he had to go. To. So whatever, and I don't believe that God does coincidence. This meeting with this lady at this well was not a coincidence because God doesn't meet by coincidence. 
he, met, he goes by plan, he goes by design. God went to meet this person and it was from the time began, he was going to be there at this time. It's like you come to church today and you made a plan to come and meet God here this morning. And you had it all arranged, you're going to get all dressed up, all ready to go, you're going to hear God this morning, you're going to meet him. But the thing is, God had already planned that. He was going to, he was already, see before you come into church this morning, he was already sitting in the pew beside you. He had already come here. He planned from even before you were born that he was going to be here on the 21st November 2020 and he was going to sit with you and he was going to be with you here this morning and he's going to meet you, but all you have to do is respond to him. So back to the story in the reading here. So the scene is set in verse 6 and 7. So Jesus was, was, was on his, was, he came to the well, he was tired, so he sat down and rested. And the time of the day was about noon. And then along comes this Samaritan woman to draw some water, and Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? Well, he just turned her thoughts, the whole world upside down, because Samaritan women, Jewish men did not ask Samaritan woman for a drink. It never happened. But why was this Samaritan woman coming at this time? It was noon. The people wouldn't go out this time of day because it's too hot. But here she was, but she was on her own. Now, in Jewish tradition and, and Samaritan tradition, they didn't do this alone. They came together to the well. The women came together and they socialized. They talked about life. They probably counseled each other. They probably listened to each other's troubles and helped each other. But they always done it together. But this lady was on her own, sneaking along the streets, making sure nobody's seen her in the heat of day, at the hardest time of day, and she came on her own. So why was she alone? It was fear. The fear, fear of shame. The shame that she knew her and felt it within herself, but other people had told her. The shame of this pointed finger of the community talking about her, talking about her life without knowing all the story. Fear of people's judgment. And this is what she's living. She's looking to avoid them. She didn't want to see them. And I wonder today, as I said before, are you suffering this? Have you suffered? Maybe you've caused the suffering because we all have gossiped. We all have talked about other people without knowing the full knowledge. Because gossip, I reckon it must be the most, one of the most unlike Jesus things to do. Jesus never gossiped. Because gossip, it costs, costs happiness to others and it costs lives. And how do we know we're not meant to gossip? John 8, 7 says, Let any one of you without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. It's like the story in the Bible where he, they, they talk about the person who's making an the accusation. They can see the splinter in somebody's eye, but not the plank in their own. How often do we in life, when we see somebody else, we do something wrong, but we highlight somebody else's wrong to make their wrong much greater than ours. So our wrong doesn't mean anything. Our wrong actually becomes right all of a sudden. So if somebody steals a million pounds, that's terrible. But if you take a pound, it's not yours. Actually, it doesn't matter now because somebody told it. So you know what I'm saying? We, we always talk about other people that their things are bigger than ours. Because who of, our, who of us were without sin? So why the shame and why the gossip? Why did this woman have shame and why was there gossip? Well, first of all, tradition. She was radicalized to believe that she was a second-class citizen. She even said herself, Jesus, you're a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink of water? Because Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She grew up knowing that she was a second-class citizen. It was in her. She didn't even know she was. She didn't even have the thought process. She just knew that she should not, she should bow down to this Jew, that she was lesser, that tradition had taught her that. And that happens in our countries too. We, we let those things happen, get in the way, when it's not true. And then her many husbands. We read about she had many husbands. Well, you know, when Jesus said to her, you know, you have five husbands, so we know she had five husbands, but more than that, she's living with another man. So the thing is, what were if you had somebody down the street and you, your friend come up to you and said, you see your woman down the street? She's just divorced your man again and she's in with another man. What would you be saying about that person? Would you be saying something nice? Oh, it must be terrible. Or would we be, be putting the boot in and saying something terrible and making up gossip without knowing the full story? Because actually I didn't even realize until Andrew told me that this, at that time, a woman couldn't divorce a man. So this woman never divorced any of those men. But you would think that oh, she, she must divorce him and get all the, the settlements and she was wealthy and rich and had loads of money and she was on to another man. But no, she never had a choice. She was divorced five times. So people would, would without knowing all the knowledge, I even assumed myself. So what were the people in the day thinking? Because often we do this. And often 
we know ourselves without people telling us what's inside us that we feel not good enough. We often feel ashamed. We often try to hide things. We do things wrong. Adam and Eve, as soon as they done, they committed their first sin, they knew to hide from God. It was just instinct. You instinctively hide. But when Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? What he was doing was he was breaking down the barrier of centuries of barriers. He was breaking down the, the barrier of sin. He was breaking down the barrier, that, or he was breaking down the law of all those accusers who were accusing and speaking about her. Jesus was starting to introduce grace. He was introducing the gospel, repent and believe. Because when God asks us certain things, like he said to this lady, well, will, I, will you give me a drink? What he was doing, he was actually asking her something greater. He, was off, he wanted the opportunity to offer something greater, just like when he speaks to you and me and asks to do something. There's something greater that he wants to give you. And he want, the greater thing he wanted to give her was living water. Living water would sustain her forever for eternal life. And that's what the living water was. And at that moment, this lady, she repented. She started to repent and believe the good news. She said to Jesus in verse 15, Sir, give me this living water so I won't go thirsty. She's starting to understand the gospel, to understand who Jesus was. She realized, and how did Jesus do this? Did he get the finger out and start telling her, oh, you done this wrong, you done that wrong, you're a bad woman? No. He took the finger of accusation, put it in his pocket, and all he done was love her. He showed kindness, gentleness towards her. That's what we're called to do. If you read 1 Peter verse, in his chapter 3, verse 15, it tells us what we're exactly doing. Say we say love Jesus. Well, we should be doing what Jesus says and what the, and 1 Peter 3.15 says. It says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, and then always prepare to give an answer to someone when they ask you the hope that you have. This hope is Jesus in your heart. You're to share it. And how are you meant to do it? With the point of finger, tell them they're wrong and they've been a sinner all their life? No, it says do this. But do this. Tell them with gentleness and with respect. And that's what Jesus done. And that's what we're called to do. So how can we know this woman knew her shame? How can we know her shame was gone? Well, if we go to verse 16, Jesus said to her, go back, to get your husband and bring her. Now at that point, you think of all these years of shame and you're, and you're hiding away from people. Are you going to automatically start telling the truth? You still get the shame in your heart. And you're in your mind, you think, oh, if I tell him I'm living with another man, what's he going to think of this great man who's just been so kind to me, so and so loving, and if I just turned around? Now what you say? He says, I don't have a husband. Straight away, we know the fear was gone. We know that she no longer was shamed anymore. She didn't have to lie anymore. She didn't have to hide anymore because Jesus took her fear away. He took her shame away. He forgave her. And that's what he can do for you and me. All we have to do is accept it. And I can testify how this feels. I grew a life up from a young age being someone younger than some of you children in here. I, I was ashamed, embarrassed about who I was. Many reasons. I mean, uh, I felt I was a second-class citizen for things that went on in my life. I was always hiding. I mean, I was one of these wee, wee skinny boys grew up with freckles, ginger hair, sticky out ears. And I have to say, those masks don't help me at all because been here, they end up out here. So, but I used to think that was a problem. But it doesn't bother me because God made me in his image. And if I criticize the sticky out ears and the freckles and the, all the rest, I'm saying God didn't do a good job. So why should I be ashamed of that? But it was making me feel ashamed because people made me feel ashamed because they said things about that. Look, I mean, Adam, I mean, I always thought, hope someday the freckles would join up and I have a brilliant suntan, but never quite happened. And there's another thing. In primary school, I told I couldn't sing. I love to sing and praise and worship. But you know what? I'm a, I'm a, I was called a foghorn at school. That stuck with me, and it still does. You see how the power of words can affect people. So... I used to learn how to deflect a conversation for myself. I was a, a master at it. You would never know anything about me. I'll tell you anything you want to know nowadays. I have no problem because when I came to faith in God 13 years ago, I've learned shame doesn't matter. I can tell you anything. It doesn't matter because it's just the way it is. That's what happened in life. I, be, I, start, I believe that Jesus loved me. That was the first thing. When I started to believe, then he forgave me my sins. That all those things I had done wrong, I was causing shame on myself. Just like this lady, just like many of us today. I, I then realized I was no longer a slave to sin, slave to fear. I was no longer, I was now a child of God, which I am now. And that same offer is for any one of you today. If you want to become no longer a slave to, to, to fear, but a child of God, you just reach out. Because we don't need to feel this fear of condemnation for him. 
because he defied logic on the cross. He defied man's logic on the cross, man's law logic on the cross. And even as his disciples were surprised, because what did they say when they come back? They said, they were seen, they said it's surprised to see him in verse 27, talking to a woman. And they were too scared that they were going to say, surely you shouldn't be talking to a woman. So they were gossiping themselves. I mean, they, they were at it, but they knew it was wrong, so they wouldn't say to Jesus because he would condemn them for it. So maybe you don't believe you're good enough here this morning. No matter what age you are, you don't believe you're good enough. When we know this woman left Jesus good enough. And if we leave here today, we'll know that God knows we're good enough. And we'll know we're good enough. Because when we read verse 28, then leaving her water jar. The water jar is symbolic of her old life. She came with the water jar because that's what mattered. She came here and, and even all the condemnation about she had dared to come to Sobey Seer to bring this water that she thought was going to sustain her life. But when she left Jesus, that no longer mattered because what had she? She had the living water. She knew the living water was sustainer. And what did she do? She, she went to get that water to bring back to the man she's living with, but she didn't. She brought the living water back to him and she brought the living water back to the people in the village, in the town, because she told him about the living water. She told him about Jesus. Come and see the Messiah, see this man. I, he told me everything about myself. And what did he do? They followed. I mean, that's totally irrational. Here's this woman who they gossiped about, who, who was one of the lowest people in society, all of a sudden stood up without fear and told people, Jesus loves me. This is the Messiah. Come and see him. He knows everything about it. Why would she declare that before she was trying to hide? All of a sudden she was open. But here's the crazy thing too. The people listened to her. I mean, why would the people listen to this person who they thought was the lower, the lower end of society? But they did listen. They listened to her. I mean, when she said, Who are, come see this man, well, they must be thinking, well, I still give her five husbands and another man. That's six. That's seven. Hang on. How many men do you want us to meet? But they listened. Why? She was filled with the grace and the Holy Spirit. The grace that set her free and the grace that opened up what she had. People could see the change in her. When people come to faith, that's what happens. Because this grace, this grace is free. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's just by believing. Because this grace is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by our works. So we can't boast about it. So the lady could only boast about what Jesus done. She couldn't boast about what she done. It's about Jesus does in us because he does it in us. And as much as the people were inspired by her testimony, and it's important that we share our testimony. How often do we tell people how God, Jesus changed our life, how we ask Jesus into our heart and how he changes us? When we're asked, what's this reason for this hope you have? How often do we tell them? It's so powerful, but it's not that it changes them. Because the people even said, no longer do we, we no longer believe, not just because of what you said, but we heard from the Messiah ourselves. They had heard the truth. Because John 8, 32 says, tells us, then you will know the truth. They heard the truth, so they knew the truth. And the truth will what? It will set you free. It will set you free of fear, of condemnation, of sin. The Samaritans had repented and, and turned to God because he was truly the Savior. The truth set them free. And my message today is the truth can set you free. And I don't know where you are with God or where you've met God, but it's a personal decision for only you can do it for yourself. The Samaritan woman could do it for herself. I can do it for myself. The Samaritan town people could do it for themselves. It's your call. Because to decide to set yourself free, you have to accept the truth. Because the truth always defeats fear. The truth always defeats the liars, the gossip. And the truth will always set you free. Because Jesus, as he's told us himself, he is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to Father except through me. So as I come to a close, in the Bible reading this morning, I said there's three kinds of people. And you're just, it's your choice to decide which one of those three you are. You might be a couple of those already. Uh, you know, the first one, are you one of those people who live in fear? Well, today, are you going to, live in, are you going to continue living in our fear? Or are you going to turn to God? There's those people who cause people to live in fear because they talk about them without due knowledge and without going and sharing the love of Christ. Are you one of those people? Or maybe you're one of those people who have already released yourself from this fear and you tell people the truth, that you're going to tell people, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to have condemnation on you. You can be free from all this. Just ask Jesus into your life so that Jesus, did, so they know the truth. So you have to decide what defines you. Is it fear? Is it gossip? Or is it telling the truth? 
So my last thought is this. this. This woman, who the world thought nobody could change, God changed her. And even more amazing than that, God got her to be an evangelist. I mean, she's the worst of the worst, and she was an evangelist for Jesus. That's truly awesome. But the question is, as they sing at football, and I think uh, it's not really right to do it, but the manager of Manchester United, I think people have been singing at him now, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? So who are you this morning? Are you like the lady in the well, like myself, and say, I am no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Will you say with me this morning, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this word. I thank you for the opportunity to share it. I pray a blessing on it. I pray that it just wins our hearts. I pray that we just don't keep it in this church, that it doesn't get locked in this church like a vault, that we take it out of here and the Holy Spirit will just flow through us, that when people ask us this week, that, you know, what is the hope? What happened in church? We tell them the truth with gentleness and respect so they will know the truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And we continue our service singing him, Are You Thirsty?
let us affirm our faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? Do you believe and trust in God the Son? Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit? This is the faith of the church. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the church worldwide that we may all be one. Grant that every member of your church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that may some peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. We pray as well for other things, Lord. We pray for COVID-19. We pray that it would end. We pray that those in ICU would be healed, though there would be no more spread of this pandemic, Lord, that it would end. Oh, Lord, we pray for all the medical staff. We pray for all the families who are going through such horrible pain. The Lord, you be with them all. We pray this day as the, as the United Nations World Day of Remembrance for road traffic victims. That can we remember in Northern Ireland this year, so far, 40 people have died, lost their lives in road traffic collisions. And that while our life ended, it then became a life sentence and it does for those 40 families. So, Lord, we pray for those families. We pray that you're, they would know your presence. They would pray the healing power of your love at this time, Lord, that they would know that, that you are the one true God and they can find their peace in you. Also, Lord, over 500 people have life-changing injuries. Their life will be changed in many ways, physically. But, Lord, we pray that while they have these injuries, Lord, that you would heal their hearts heal their souls and minds, that they would be with them. We pray for our emergency services, who all serve us every day without prejudice, without cause for themselves, that they leave their families in service, Lord. We thank you, and we pray that you protect them. We pray for Joanne. We pray that while she's unwell, Lord, that you would heal her. We pray also the ones and the loved ones suffer as well, Andrew, David, Christine, and Hannah, Lord, that you would be with them, that would they, they would just feel the reassurance of you. Good Lord, we do pray with all our hearts and in the power of the Holy Spirit that you would heal her. We pray for those people who live in fear, fear of condemnation, fear that keeps them from you, Lord, that, kill, that keeps them from the well of me and you, Lord. We pray that they would know and thirst for this living water. Lord, we pray that we would be people that would help them. We would guide them. That what we have this, that what we feel in this church this morning and feel their presence, that we would take it with us, Lord. And Lord, we pray for all those who are out. We pray all those in a moment of silence in our, in our own lives, the ones we love and know. We pray for those in need of your touch. And in the silence we bring to them, bring them to your throne of grace. And we say together, stretch out your hand to bring healing to those who are sick. Comfort all those who mourn and hope in those in despair. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And let us sing with all our hearts, Tell out my soul.
Jesus Christ, you emptied yourself, taking the form of a servant. Lord Jesus Christ, for your sake you became poor. And we say together, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and the insults you have borne me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day on day. Amen. And we say to each other the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, with us all forevermore. Amen. So let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>